Colossians 2.4 says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. We discussed that verse last time, but I've got some definitions for that as well. That word beguile, that's the word that's most often used to describe Satan, by the way, when you look at Satan's dealings with people down through time. And that word beguile means to deceive or elude by craft. To mislead by craft. And it's interesting because every time you look at the issue of that, that word beguile, and it's whether it's deceiving or misleading, the definition attaches the word by craft to both of those. And that is, that is a reference to a very specific use of tools that's a purposeful thing to purposely try to accomplish something. So it's not, beguile isn't just misleading or eluding or deceiving. It's doing so by a craft, by a certain set of tools that you use with the purpose of tricking the person or the listener. And that's interesting because what did we learn about Satan? Why can't Satan just tell you the truth? What's John 8, 44 say? It's an impossibility for Satan to do anything but purposely deceive because he's a liar and the truth is not in him according to John 8, 44. The word enticing, that word that, that says to beguile you with enticing words. So it's not just that he tricks and deceives. It's not just that there's people in Bible doctrine that would trick and deceive, but they do so purposefully. And one of the things they use are enticing words. That word enticing is to incite to evil, to urge to sin by motives, flattery, or persuasion. Well, if that doesn't explain the state of, of Christianity today, to urge to sin by motives, flattery, and persuasion. So it's not just that it's nice, good words, but the intent that's behind it. You look at everything we've ever learned and, 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 and taught about Satan, and that is him by nature. Anything that he's ever taught, everything that he's ever accomplished to do, he's done so with a set purpose to deceive, with a set of guidelines and, and, and methods and motives that he uses, most oftentimes with persuasion and niceties. He doesn't mind talking about the Bible. He doesn't mind talking about Jesus as long as it's the wrong one, the one that God's not using. We're in Colossians 2, 4. Go down to verse 8. This is where we're going to try to get into. Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And what I said at the end of the last message, which, hey, I can say that that was last Sunday now. Usually I say last Sunday, but it was last time I taught. But last Sunday we talked about those three issues. And what's the first word of verse 8? Beware. This whole chapter, verse 4 that we just read, and this I say, lest any man beguile you. Verse 8, beware. If you, so we went down through these three areas where there's an attempt to spoil you, to move you off the line. Our whole, our whole message foundation is Ephesians 6, the, the armor of God, and the spiritual battle that we're in. And Satan's whole goal, according to Ephesians 6, is to do what? Make it to where you stop standing. Go to Ephesians 6 real quick. We're going to come right back there. So leave your hand there that I just didn't do. So we're going to come right back. But this whole line of messages started from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the dead. There's those set bag of tricks that he uses. The wiles, the trickery. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore. We said it a second ago. Whatever God's plan for the believer is, what's Satan's? No matter what the instruction is. Whatever God says, what does Satan want? Whatever the opposite is. Because he's a liar and the truth of God is not in him. So whatever God wants, whatever the truth that God wants for you today, Satan wants exactly the opposite. In that, in that passage of Ephesians 6, verse 11 says to stand. Verse 13 says to withstand and to stand. Verse 14 says to stand. What's Satan's goal for the believer? To not stand. To compromise your position. Well, maybe that's not so bad. Maybe we... No. No. So when we get to Colossians 2.8, where we just were, and he's giving out warnings, warnings, warnings. There's four, there's three warnings there, and, and here in the, in the uh, um, we're going to go down here in a minute, and we're going to get a fourth warning about how all these things work. The first one is philosophy and vain deceit. Unfortunately, we're not going to get any further today than this one. What's the next one? There in that verse. Traditions of men. Each one of these in and of itself are a stronghold that Satan uses. And the third one there? Rudiments of the world. We talked that that whole chapter is a chapter of warning and, and, and describing how bad Bible doctrine goes out. Told you, I can't talk and write at the same time. <laughs> so he goes through those. Go down to uh, verse 18. Now this verse that we're getting ready to read now, for whatever reason, makes a lot of people angry. What we have to make sure that we understand and make the choice to do is, let's just believe what the Word of God says. There's a verse that says, let God be true and... Every man a liar. Let's just believe the word. And I'll say this before I read the verse. You can go out and grab any most Bible versions. And in the Bible versions, they don't just change this verse. They flat out change it to say exactly the opposite. Verse 18, Colossians 2.18. Let no man beguile you. Isn't that what we've been talking about? The, the methods that men and Satan use to beguile the Bible believer? So there's another warning. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. So the subject matter is going to be angels. Intruding into those things which he... What's the next three words? I mean, that verse just says that people who talk about voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, they're entering into something that they've not seen. Most Bible versions switch that and say, intruding into those things which he hath seen. Remember we talked about from the beginning, say nads to, subtracts, questions, and then what? So first one, fourth one. Just flat out denies it. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. Why would somebody talk about angels and seeing them if they really haven't seen them? Vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. The fourth area of warning there is the issue of extra-biblical revelation. It 
If I show up here this morning and I tell you, <clears throat> on, the way to, on the way to church this morning, God came and spoke to me. And he told me, when I get to church, instruct everybody there to get out their checkbooks and write me your life savings and put it in the offering plate. How would you know if that's true? Does the Word of God tell you to write your entire life savings to Grace Bible Church? No, it does not. I'm getting into an area of extra biblical revelation. I'm telling you to do something that the Word of God didn't tell you to do. Amen. And if I do that, what are you to do with that instruction? There's another passage that says, flee. When men start doing that, you get away and you flee. Because that's one of the areas that can make you a child is getting into that bad Bible doctrine that God didn't tell you. You go to any average church today and you know what the instruction most of the Bible lesson is going to be about? God told me, God whispered to me, God impressed upon me. Do you know what the problem with that is in nature? The problem with that by nature is we teach that God's word is complete. Paul says, I came to fulfill the word of God. That word, F-U-L-F-I-L. What does that word mean? It means complete. And if Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, I came to fulfill, that is to complete the word of God. If the word of God is complete, is God going to be talking to me specifically and only to give you a message? It's impossibility. If the word of God is complete, then it's what? Then it's complete. Can I add anything to that of, my, uh, of anything that I have to say or think if it's complete and full and nothing to be added? That's why God wrote this book in this way is to eliminate men who can come along and try to trick you and say, oh, well, God said to me because you can't confirm whether God told me that or not, can you? if you don't know any better. But you can confirm if God whispered that to me, if you understand the book's complete. And if the book's complete, did God whisper anything to me to give you a message? No. I don't know anything more or less than you can get from reading the Word of God yourself. And that's got to be the way that it is. There can't be extra biblical revelation or else I have an advantage, don't I? as the guy standing up here behind the pulpit, I can say whatever I want to say, and you have to follow it because maybe God did tell me something that you guys didn't get. Because after all, don't most men teach that they're on the pedestal and God works specifically through them and God specifically called them into the ministry? Why do you think that teaching is rampant today? Because then now I can never be proven wrong because, well, maybe God did tell me something that you don't know. Maybe. I'm here to say, no, he didn't. And not just because I don't think God talks, because the Word of God says it's complete. That's why. I have a reason for that. So those are the four major devices that the Apostle Paul here in the book of Colossians warns about. In all of those devices, philosophy and vain deceit, traditions of men, rudiments of the world, and extra-biblical revelation, what those four, all of them do, is encourage the Bible reader, or the Bible student, or the average churchgoer, it encourages those people to go back and live as if they're the nation of Israel under the law, and not as full-grown adult sons and daughters of God today in the dispensation of grace. They all have the same end goal, all four of those. Did you know that you have the exact same capacity to read and understand this book as anybody in the whole world that's ever stood behind a pulpit? That is liberating the first time you come to understand that. 
It's liberating. Because the Word of God is complete. And you know what it takes to understand this book? You just got to be saved. And the Spirit of God comes to reside within you. And then your spirit bears witness with God's Spirit that you're a child of God. And He becomes the teacher. As you read the book. But do you know one thing that you'll never come to understand? You'll never come to understand any Bible issues unless you take it out and read it for yourself. But think back in your life to people you've encountered and you've tried to under- explain some Pauline truth and they just flat out reject it. The reason is likely due to one of those four things. The reason people normally reject Bible doctrine as we understand it to be rightly divided in the, in the mystery of the revelation. It's usually in one of those things. They've been spoiled by the philosophy or the wisdom of the world. You tell people that they're saved by grace. Christ died on the cross for their sins. And when you place your faith in that alone, Romans 4, 4 and 5, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, with no works, there is nothing you can do in and of yourself to earn it. You place your faith in the salvation that God died for your sins and shed his innocent blood and it covers every one of your sins past, past, present and future the moment that you believe that with no works involved take your works they're as filthy rags God doesn't need them you know what? and if they, someone <clears throat> doesn't understand that do you know one of the first things they'll tell you in response to that well, let me go ask my pastor let me go ask my grandma or grandpa Let me go run that by my parents. You know what the biggest problem with those responses are? Those people, those traditions have taken precedence over the Word of God. Just read the Bible. Is that what the Bible says to do? Is that what the verses tell you to do? Let God be true and... Or maybe they can't break away from some tradition. Well, this is the way I've always believed, though. My parents and my grandparents and my great-great-grandparents have always attended that church and believed that same message. But our church doctrinal statement says just traditions. Is that what the Bible says? Or maybe they're taken by the rudiments of the world and the law-keeping, keeping keeping of the law. Or likely, they've given ear to extra-biblical revelation. Yeah, but God told me, or God whispered to me, or God impressed upon me, or my guardian angel spoke to me and led me to fill in the blank. So let's just try to go through over the course of the next however long this is going to take to go through these areas, kind of detailed one at a time. That clock doesn't work, so I'm just trying to keep track of time. So the, next, the first one up is philosophy and vain deceit. And I'll just say this before we get started about philosophy and vain deceit. Philosophy is, is a, it can be a very, very tricky thing. How many here have taken philosophy classes in college or or high school or whatever? Has anybody taken any philosophy classes? I've taken taken two. (laughs) You took PE. You're a PE specialist. I get it. (laughs) Yeah. If you've taken philosophy, it can talk in some of the most crazy circles you've ever heard. The first time I walked into philosophy class, freshman in college, the teacher, we're all sitting in chairs, of course, and he asks us, what are you all sitting in? Chair. He says, now, is that really a chair? Or is that a piece of wood with four stubs hanging from the bottom of it? I knew right then we were in for some kind of a question is that? 
But what philosophy in the end seeks to do is to take God out of the picture and explain it in man's terms. Philosophy, here's the definition of philosophy. An explanation for the reasons of things. An investigation into the cause of all phenomena, both of the mind and of matter. So we're trying to explain, let's just take an easy one. How did the world get created? <clears throat> if you ever can get into the study of science and biology and go to the very, very root of it, and the amount of things that have to line up to keep the, 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 the world on its axis that it's on is mind-blowing. But yet it stays, doesn't it? How did the world get created? How does it turn... Do you know a thousand years... What is the date today? 29th of April? You know a thousand years ago on the 29th of April, the sun rose at exactly the same time and second and will set at exactly the same, same time and second tonight as it has a thousand years ago and every year since then. How does that happen? Well, do you know what philosophy attempts to do? Well, let's find out. And do you know what their answer has never been? Because God did it, created it that way. You know, God's a pretty amazing individual, if you haven't discovered that yet. Man can't attempt to even begin to understand the possibility of a being creating the earth. And you know what? You and I can't understand the, the start of that either, can we? So it's easier for philosophers to try to explain that away in terms that man can understand than to just say, you know what, God created it. You know, philosophers would rather understand that there was a humongous explosion that sent all of those events into motion than just to say, the God of the heaven and the universe just created it. For me, I'm the opposite. It's much easier for me to say, you know what, God created it, and I'll leave the details to him than to try to explain every single process by an explosion. <laughs> well, then, where did the explosion come from then? Oh, I don't know about that. I'm just saying. Well, there had to been something prior to an explosion then. If something exploded, then something was before the... Philosophy is very crazy. But philosophy can be a good thing. And we're going to look at an instance in Acts where Paul questions some philosophers, but philosophy, because of what it is, can motivate you and I to investigate the causes of something. It can motivate you and I to see why are things that way. Let's take issues of biology out of it. Take the issue of Bible doctrine and the Bible. Philosophy encourages you and I, or should encourage you and I, to try to figure out what is this book about? How did it come to be? Why did it come to be? What is its purpose? What can it accomplish in my life? Can it accomplish anything? Was it just a book of a bunch of old guys sat around and wrote it? That's what all academia would have you believe today that the Bible is a book of nothing that a bunch of really old guys just sat back and, and wrote thousands of years ago. You should pay no attention to it. But philosophy can motivate you to look at some things. So be careful with philosophy. With philosophy... The Word of God is not the final authority. However, the philosopher can explain things in man's wisdomly terms. That's the final authority and not the Word of God. And that's the difference between seeing the benefit of philosophy and getting us interested in how things happened and the danger of philosophy that says, 
wow, you're really intelligent. You can figure out anything without this old book. That's the danger of philosophy. Philosophy has the capacity to spoil you and make you think you're someone in your own mind. Because you think you've got all the answers. That's the warning here. Philosophy and vain deceit. Turn back to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Paul knew about a little bit of benefit of philosophy, but avoiding the pitfalls of it. In Acts chapter 17, Paul here is on uh, Mars Hill. Let's just cut in in verse um, 17. We're not going to get into what's going on here. That's not the purpose of going here. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. If I didn't say so, I'm in Acts 17, 17. Verse 18. Then certain... What's the next word? Philosophers. You're not going to get too far in, any, in anything before you run into some philosophers that are going to try to explain it to you. <laughs> Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Have you ever talked about to, to folks about Christ died on a cross for your sins? And, you know, everybody always says, oh, that's the best thing I've ever heard, right? <laughs> no. Some people will think you're nuts. What will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preaches unto them Jesus and the resurrection. I've talked with people before that have tried to explain to them how Christ died for their sins and they, they claim that you're in a cult. That's mostly what you get accused of when you tell people that Christ died for their sins. And he was resurrected the third day for your justification. Romans 3. Where does that come from? Oh, that's cultish. That comes from the area of philosophy. And the same thing happened here. He seemed to be set or forth a strange god. He's involved with a cult, with a bunch of strange gods. And you know what his, the only thing he, that Paul had done here to get that accusation? He preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. That's all he did. That's the verse just says it at the end of verse 18. Verse 19, And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. That's interesting. Because when you start telling people they need to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, those exact words... You know what they say? Where did you get that from? What new doctrine are you in? And they've never heard the term rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that is a cover-up for people to have never heard that term. I better move on or I'm never going to get through anything. For, uh, jump down to verse 21. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. This is just a crazy passage. If you ever get time, go back and read all this. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Now, he's talking to these folks... <clears throat> But don't forget who's in this crowd that he's talking to. We, we started in verse 17. He disputed in the, in the synagogue. Now let me ask you something. Who's in synagogues at this time? All the chief priests. The Jews, the chosen 
nation of God that should have known what was going on. It says that the chief priests sat in the high parts of the synagogues. He's in a synagogue with the devout persons, all the reputation people. It's got all the reputations, the well-knowns. But yet nobody has ever even heard of the resurrection and claimed that he's spread new information based on some cult. I found that just, well, shouldn't be very surprising. Paul says, I perceive in all things you're too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotion, so they're having Bible devotions, but don't know anything about the Bible or, or about Christ and the resurrection. But when I passed by your devotions, I found an altar, they even got an altar going, and the inscription, and the inscription read, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. You say you're worshiping the unknown God, well, I'll tell you about God, he says. Verse 24, <clears throat> God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Jump down to verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. What Paul is attempting to do there, he says, you know, your own poets have talked about these things. Your own poets have talked about why we live and move and our reason for being. So he uses that, 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 that baseline of philosophy and says, well, let me tell you about what your own poets are even talking about. They're referring to it as the unknown God. They're curious to know how things have come to be. I'll tell you about that. So he uses that baseline philosophy for a good to get to, this is what the Word of God says. He uses their reason for motivation to study out these things as an end to share the Word of God and give them the answers. So it can be good. It can be a motivator. But you know, as you look around trying to find the answers to things that don't make sense is probably, what, is probably the reason you became a Bible student anyway. You saw all the garbage going out in Christianity. You saw all the garbage going out in the world. And you said, you know what, I want to see what God says for myself in his book. And that is the motivator. Philosophy can motivate us to find answers. But the reason for warning is don't find those answers in man's wisdom and allow that to take precedence over the Word of God and what God says. When he talks about philosophy and vain deceit, that's what he's getting at. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or turn forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Anything that you and I allow to take precedence or importance over the Word of God has the capacity to spoil you. Talked about being spoiled by, first of which, philosophy and vain deceit. It has the, anything that you allow to take precedence over the Word of God, any of these things or anything else you can think of, if, it, if we allow it to take precedence over the completed written Word of God, we have the ability to be spoiled by that, which then moves us off of the line, causes us to move away from the Word of God, and causes us not to stand for it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you ever have a second to read slowly and many times in a row, verses 18 to 31, I would encourage you to do that. 
Verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. It, being the preaching of the cross, is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? See, in the end, all the wisdom that men think that they have gained and have all the answers to, God's going to have the final say on that stuff. And it's just going to be foolishness at that point. Verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. That's interesting. Do you know why the world doesn't know God and what he did and who he is? Because they're wrapped up in what they refer to as wisdom. (laughs) See, wisdom... can be a very bad thing. Because most oftentimes people use wisdom way more and place way more importance on wisdom than on on God and, and what he's doing. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. In all times throughout the Bible, Do you know who the Bible believer was in every single time mentioned in the Bible? You mentioned this term a few weeks ago. It's just the common man. The common man who is just simple enough and honest enough to say, I'm going with the Word of God on this topic. I know that wisdom sounds really cool. I get it. But I'm sticking with the book on this. No matter the subject. And the common man, not the ones in the chief seats at the synagogues, not the ones with thousands of members of people at their, at their assemblies, not the people who are looked up to behind all the big pulpits, the common man, you and I, that just say, you know what, let's see what the book has to say about it. That's who God has worked to and through his whole life, the, the, whole, the whole history of the Word of God. And it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. You know, the world looks at us and this preaching and what we're doing right now, and they think this is the most foolish thing in the entire universe. That's the biggest waste of an hour and 15 minutes that you could have ever put time to. By the way, we usually get out at 11.15 as long as Tyler's not preaching. It's 11.14. They just think it's foolishness. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. That talking about wisdom of the Word of God there. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. We mentioned a minute ago, when you start talking to people and say the cross is all that matters... We preach Christ crucified. That's going to be a stumbling block to some because they've tried to put it in so many other terms what saves them that to say it's just the cross and believing that seems absolutely ludicrous and cultish to some people. But God says, I'm going to use that foolishness. I'm going to use the foolishness of preaching to save people. And in the end, the people who think they've got it They're the ones that's going to have just a bunch of foolishness left. Really interesting if you can take some time to read it over and over. Because, you know why that's going to happen? Verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You know, at Christ's very weakness, standing on the cross completing our salvation, the very weakest moment of his entire life. He defeated Satan and earned salvation for you when you trust and believe in that event. That is the very weakest moment. So we can, we kind of got a choice to make. Do we go with the masses? Do we go with the wisdom of the world? 
That puts it in a very interesting way right there. That verse 22 says, the Jews require a sign. Oh, well, God manipulated circumstances so that I could. And, oh, God found them a spouse. Oh, if God would just show me a sign. You can live that way, or you can just seek after the wisdom of God and the Word of God. It's really, a, it's just, a, it comes down to a choice. God says in verse 28, And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Do you know why God not just prefers or instructs us not to work for salvation, but do you know why God has required faith only in his finished work? and nothing that you can do to earn it? Do you know why God chose that avenue for salvation? Because if you could have a part in your salvation and work for it, our flesh would glory, verse 29 talks about. Romans talks about him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Not of works. What's the rest of that verse? Lest any man should boast. If you could work and get and gain your own salvation, or if you could have a part in trusting in the cross plus doing some kind of work to earn your salvation, do you know what every one of us would do if we had that capability? Every one of us would brag, look what I did, look at me. But if you trust in what Christ did in the completed work of the cross, do you know where your brag is then? You step aside and you say, look what Christ did for me. And without it, I'd be a lost sinner on my way to splitting the pits of hell wide open. My only involvement is that is just to trust it by faith. His faith is counted for righteousness. If you understand that, you've really got something that practically everybody in this universe doesn't have, and that's the assurance of knowing for sure right now today, if I were to die, walking, going out on that street, pulling out, somebody smashes me and I die. You know where I am in one second from that time? I'm in heaven. And nobody can take that away from you. You can't out that, because once you're saved, you're sealed to the day of redemption, Ephesians 1.13 and Ephesians 4.30-32, 29-32. You're sealed. You're sealed. The second you believe and understand that, place your faith in it. Next time, we might get to number two, number three, and number four. <laughs> Let's pray and we'll have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Thank you all for coming and I uh, hope to see you back. Thank you, visitors, for, for coming. Um, we'd be delighted to have you back and thank you for being here. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful and thankful for this time. We're thankful for your word that is complete in its totality. We're thankful that like the Bereans, we can go and look into your word and just trust that. But I pray like the Berean, we would search the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so and that nobody in this world would believe anything that I say or we say as a group without verifying it with your book. We're thankful for the completed word. We're most thankful, Lord, for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was faithful to go to the cross and pay for the sins of those that understand it and believe it and place their faith in it. I pray now as we leave, we would draw our peace and contentment and happiness and our purpose of life in that and in the truths that your word has set out. We pray these things in your name. Amen.